All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 49 of the Massive Breakdown Podcast. We have a fantastic episode for you today. We think it's going to be super beneficial in terms of learning about how to play PvP. We're going to be talking about map knowledge, of course. It's something that's been a long time coming, but we have put it off until we thought we could really crush this episode, knock it out of the park. And what better time than the day before we head down to Guardian Con? But in the meantime, let's get the introductions out of the way. As always, I am Mercules, joined by my co-host, Kit Kutcher. How are you doing tonight, Kit? Uh, man, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, I'm already in Tampa. I just came from uh, a Guardian meetup at the Wing House, which was lit as shit. Man, that place was crazy. The first thing we're going to go over is just map layouts in general. There's two main layouts that the Destiny map designers used. Um, and they're very, very common in all types of games, not just in Destiny. They're extremely common. And then there's a couple of less used ones that we're going to talk about. We're going to hit them just as one-offs, just so you understand that they're in there. But the two biggest ones that you're going to see are circular maps and three-lane maps. So circular maps are one of the very, very first map designs that existed in first-person shooter games. Uh, they're extremely simple. Um, the way I want you to imagine a circular map, first off, I can give you a couple of examples so you can picture this in your mind's eye. Uh, Cauldron is a circular map. Timekeeper is a circular map. Icarus is, well, from what I understand, maybe a circular map. I don't know. I don't play Icarus. I'm not on PS4, but <laughs> from what I can see of it, you know, from gameplay, it looks like to be a circular map. Um, Anomaly is a circular map. Floating Gardens is a circular map that can be played a little bit differently than most of them, but it is still a circular map in general. Um, geez, what's another one? Skyline is like a semi-circular map, which is pretty cool. Um, but the, the, the way you have to look at a circular map is like this. Imagine a series of concentric circles. You've got one circle in the center, and we can call that like the hub. And picture it as like the hub cap of a tire. And then you've got a bigger circle on the outside. And if you've got two bigger circles, one can be the rim and one can be the tire itself. So you've got the biggest circle on the outside, a smaller circle on the inside, and then a much smaller circle on the inside. And connecting all these circles, you have spokes, which in the game are basically passageways from the outer circles to the inner circles. Um, the easiest way you can do this is imagine that you're looking down on the top of Cauldron. You've got B right in the center. That is that inner circle. That's that hub. And then you've got hallways. You've got the hallway leading to outside heavy. You've got the hallway leading to A, the hallway leading to C. And then you've got two more hallways going outside. Those are the spokes. And then the outer ring, which is the ring that's made from going to A, to inside heavy, to C, to outside, to outside heavy, and then all the way back around outside, back into A, that's the outer ring. That's that tire or that rim. In this case, it's the tire because it is the outer ring. So that is a circular map right there. That is the basic layout. If you look at Timekeeper, it's the exact same way. You've got that inner section, which is kind of where B and the lobby are, and then you've got little hallways leading out and out and out, and then in Timekeeper, we actually do have like a rim and a tire. We have two different concentric circles because we have that crazy, I guess you could call it a beach. You've, we've got that crazy, you know, sand area on the outside that actually has some relatively long sight lines. And one of the things you have to think about with circular maps is the sight lines basically get longer as you go farther out. That center part is very tight, very claustrophobic. It's very chaotic. It's close range battles all day. Looking in the spokes towards the center from the outside, you get mid range kind of, and then being all the way on the outside, you get the longest sight lines. But something that's very, very common with circular maps like Anomaly, like Timekeeper, uh, like most of Floating Gardens, is you don't have a ton of long sight lines. Because the maps are curved, the outer boundaries of the maps are curved, most of the sight lines are then also blocked off by the boundaries curving back in. So that's something that's very, very important to keep in mind when you're playing a circular map, with the exception basically of a few parts on the outer, outer rim of circular maps. Long range weapons aren't necessarily the way to go on those, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the thing that I always find on a circular map is that it, it does tend to uh, drive conflict toward the center and, and in a very uh, a mobile or a rotating manner. Um, you don't necessarily have kind of a, a clear conflict zone except right in the middle there where it's, it's all kind of moving, moving in a circle around that, around that central zone. The way I look at it is if you take the hub and then you take the spokes and you take the outer thing, in between each one of those spokes is what's basically what I'd call a quadrant. Imagine it looking like a slice of pie, basically. And I find that with circular maps, there's always pitched battle directly in the center in the hub. 
And then the rest of the battle kind of wraps around and moves through those quadrants. Sometimes it flows into the hub, sometimes it flows a little bit out of the hub, but the battle basically rotates around those quadrants. Yep. There's not really like a, this is my side, this is your side, we defend this side, we attack this side. It kind of circles around the hub. And that, I think, is a major defining difference between circular maps and the next type of map we're going to talk about, three lanes. But before we get into that, I just want to, again, I want to summarize basically what it is with circular maps. So circular maps, it's the hub in the center, spokes going to the outside, and depending on the number of circular lanes we have on the outside, the next biggest one would be the rim, the one after that would be the tire, all right? So that's the layout. You know, the battle types, it's pretty much close range on the inside 100% of the time. You can get mid-range on the outside, uh, but the vast majority of the time, you're not going to have super long sight lines. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Outside on Skyline has some okay long sight lines. Um, you know, from top B on Floating Gardens, looking down onto the Alpha and Bravo spawns is an okay long sight line. But the thing is, those are pretty easily avoidable just by pushing into the center of the hub. And then again, there's not like a defined front, like a line where a team attacks and defends on either side. There's quadrants around the hub and the battle kind of rotates through those quadrants. So those are the things I think you really need to understand about circular maps uh, to, you know, kind of grasp what their actual concept is. Yeah, I think you really, I think you really nailed that there. Um, so I guess moving into three lane maps, uh, let, let's break them down in the same way here. So just a, a, first off, a couple examples of some three lane maps for you. Um, some good ones that come to mind would be Asylum, uh, Bannerfall, uh, Black Shield, and Pantheon of course is, is really a classic three lane map as well. Um, so three lane maps really come in a couple of different shapes. The, the most defining um, part of that shape is that there's going to be like a square, a rectangle, or a diamond with a cross in the middle. Um, so for an example of a diamond shaped map, you would look at Asylum uh, where you have kind of a straight line through the middle from Alpha to Bravo and then you're going to have uh, two, uh, two outer lanes that are going to be kind of making the outside points of that diamond uh, going up to Bravo, or I'm sorry, up to B inside and then down uh, through Atrium and then back, back in to Bravo spawn through, uh, through your C flag area. Um, so that kind of defines a diamond-shaped three-lane map. You, you could also have a rectangular uh, three-lane map. Um, for a good good example of a rectangular three-lane map, uh, we could look at Burning Shrine, which is going to have two very long outside lanes running from Alpha to C flag and from Bravo to A flag, and then a central lane uh, right down the middle from Heavy to Heavy. Um, and that's going to have a couple of different cross uh crosses inside it so that's the other thing to know about a three lane map there can be more than one crosses you can have really as many as the map designers want to make um, so like on burning shrine you really have three uh, you know one cross one running from outside eight outside C one running through the pillar room and then one running through the inside platform and inside heavy um, and then you can also have a square shaped uh, three lane map so a really simple example of that would just be black shield um, well, if you look at the map itself, it does not look very square shaped. If you look at what you're actually playing, the the, the space you're using, you're essentially uh, going to have three lanes running from uh, A to C through inside, uh, running across B, and then running across outside heavy. It makes it very square shaped if you look at the space that you're actually using in combat on that map. So I feel like this is something we probably should have defined earlier, um, but lanes themselves, I don't know if we talked about the definition of that. I don't think we did. It's because we talk about so much that we just, you know, know what we're talking about when we mention a lane. A lane is basically a path that you can take to travel through the map, and it's not an out of the way path. It's a path that is designed for you to move from one point in the map to another. And the way lanes work is they move in the direction between the two spawns. So if you have Alpha spawn on the left and Bravo spawn on the right, the lanes move between Alpha and Bravo spawn from one to the other. Then the cross lanes that we're talking about are lanes that intersect those normally at a 90 degree angle. So, you know, the Black Shield example you just gave, you've got Alpha over here on the left, 
Yep. And then you've got a lane going through, just like what you said, going through inside to Bravo. That's the first lane. You've got a lane going across B. That's the second lane. You've got a lane going from outside special to outside special on either side. That's the third lane. This is where the three lane design comes from. Then you also have the lanes going from alpha to outside special, from Charlie to outside special, and from heavy to heavy. Those are the cross lanes. So on Black Shield, it's three lanes, and then it's got three crossing lanes. Yep. On Bannerfall, it's the same thing. On Asylum, however, there's only that one crossing lane. It's just going from B to Atrium to low heavy. There aren't really crossing lanes by Bravo or by Alpha Spawn because there's not too much useful space back there. So there's only one crossing lane. And then just like Kutch was saying, on Pantheon, you've got five crossing lanes. Yeah, You've got the three going from Alpha to Bravo and from Bravo to Alpha, those spawns. But then you've got you know, the bridge on the inside. You've got inside heavy that's a cross lane. You've got pillar room that's a cross lane. You've got outside heavy that's a cross lane. And then you've got all the way down in the sand that's another cross lane. So you've got five cross lanes up there. So you can go all the way from one cross lane to five cross lanes, at least that we've seen in Destiny. Yep. Yeah, and there are a number of examples of those. Like, like we could say Pantheon, Frontier, both have five cross lanes. Um, there, there are a lot of different examples. I think uh, to those cross lanes are kind of a, a a way to tell the difference between like the diamond, the square, and the rectangular shaped three lane map. So your diamond shaped maps, I think in general, are only going to have that one main cross lane. The other lanes are going to be angling out from that center starting point. Um, and with the square maps, of course, they're going to be shaped like a square. So it's pretty much going to be three by three. Um, and then, of course, the rectangular maps are going to tend to have five crossing lanes because they're going to be longer uh, than they are wide. And so, like, you know, Pantheon, um, Burning Shrine, obviously, we've been talking about a lot. It's a great example of that as well. Um, and so that's that's really how you can kind of tell the difference and get a sense for what type of map you're on. Um, which is obviously very important knowledge. If you understand what type of map you're on, then then you kind of know the layout right from the get go, and you just have to learn the particulars. Um, but I, I yeah, don't want to get too much into that yet. We're going to come back to to some of that in a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the battle types on a three lane map because it is different from a circular map. It's very different. So on a three lane map, you're going to tend to have some very long sight lines along the outside. Um, which are going to support more sniper battles, scout rifle battles, uh, more of that long-range combat. Um, in many cases, you'll also have some cover that does, of course, support mid-range combat as well, but, but closer-range combat tends to be focused around the crossroads, those, those cross points. Um, and what, what you see happening on a three-lane map that you don't really get on a circular map is that combat tends to flow back and forth. It tends to flow in straight lines between Alpha and Bravo, whereas on a circular map, like we talked about before, you know, like you were saying, Mercules, it, it tends to be quadrants that kind of circle around the middle. So you tend to have kind of a circular flow to battle on that circ circular map, which makes sense, whereas on a three-lane map, it tends to be uh, more of a defined front that you're going to be attempting to uh, either defend if you're getting pushed back or that you're going to be attempting to push forward uh, in order to take control of more map and and you know obviously hopefully for you spawn trap your enemies so that they are forced to make bad decisions um, and fight from a disadvantageous position yeah exactly right so the best way you can look at it is like it's a front and we'll just use burning shrine as an example because it's one of the easiest ones to visualize for a lot of players so if you start at bravo and you start to push out, the middle of the cross lanes is right going through that pillar room. Yep. So if you and the other team both meet in pillar room, that's where the front kind of forms, right? That's where the engagements are happening. And it doesn't necessarily mean that your player body is physically in pillar room, but it's where you're basically shooting into. It's where you're looking at. It's where your aim is. It's where the engagement is occurring. Um, if you are only able to make it to the bridges on the inside which is just one cross lane past your initial spawn. And the other team is in pillar room, and they're keeping you from being able to push that engagement to pillar room. You are now basically in a spawn trap. You're being contained. You are now trying to push out, push out, push out. You're trying to push that front back towards the opposing team spawn. 
And if they've got control of Pillar Room and they're firing into bridges, or adversely, you have control of Pillar Room and you're firing into outside C and outside A, or you're firing into that outside platform, you now have control over it. However, if you push too far, for example, if you start on Alpha, which is the outside spawn on Burning, Burning Shrine, and you pass, you push all the way up to inside bridge, and it's any game type that allows for free-flowing spawns, you're going to flip the spawn. Super important to know that. So good teams will recognize, good teams will recognize how far up they can push to trap the other team and keep them, the other team now has to press and try to get out. And good teams will recognize this is how far we go and we're going to hold the front right here. And you'll see snipers looking down the lanes. You'll see shotguns sitting on the other side of lanes, fusion rifles. You'll basically see the other team, the team that's being trapped, will die and respawn in basically the same area the entire time. Yep. And that's a spawn trap. You see it all the time on Pantheon too. It's a spawn trap. That's what it is. And good teams understand how to make that happen. To give you maybe a concrete example from Crucible play, just look at control as an example. Really good teams in control, unless they're just absolutely dominating, um, are only going to ever take two control points. You're going to take your initial spawn on, and I guess we'll kind of come back to uh, to symmetrical versus non-symmetrical maps. But you're going to take you're going to take one of the outside spawns, Alpha, um, or I'm sorry, A or C, and then you're going to take B, and you're just going to hold those two. Um, and you're gonna you're gonna hold that that front just past B, uh, in order to force the other team to constantly attack from a disadvantageous position. And that's that's kind of how you define your front, right? And you don't want to push past that because if you push to C, if you take that third point, just like Mercury's described, you've now flipped the spawn. That means the enemy is now going to be spawning close to A, and you've essentially reversed where that front is at, right? That front line that was advantageous, that allowed you to control more of the map than the enemy, now has you trapped in less of the map than the enemy, and you've uh, you've essentially uh, hurt yourself. And so it's really important to understand where that front is and how far you can and can't go. What's that? They say, congratulations, you played yourself. If you flip the spawns, <laughs> congratulations, you played yourself. Yeah. That's the way it works. Don't flip the spawns. Don't do it. Don't take the third point. Don't push too aggressively. The whole reason, and what's funny is it comes down to predictability. The whole reason you want to hold that front is so that you know exactly where the enemy is going to be coming from. You are never surprised. You are the person looking at the corner knowing someone is going to run around it. And we're going to talk about that in fantastic depth later on in the episode, but that's what it is. You don't want to be surprised. You want the enemy to be predictable. If you know where they're spawning and where they're coming from, you can predict what they're going to do. And good players can do it with near 100% certainty. If you flip the spawns, now you don't know where they're spawning. They're spawning behind you, that's for certain, but you don't know where they're going to be coming from, and you now have to turn around and run back and try to push the front the other direction. So that's why I say you played yourself. Yep. Don't do it. Understand where the lanes are, where the cross lanes are, and understand where you need to sit. Yep, yep. There, There is a situation where you do want to flip those spawns, but we'll talk about that, I think, when we get when we get through the map knowledge section here into or I'm sorry, through the map layout section and into some of the map knowledge and how to use that. Um, and for the most part, though, you're, you know, once you've established your position on the map, yeah, you just want to hold it. You just want to take that easy win. Don't don't make yourself work harder. Make the other team work harder. So, again, just to summarize, characteristics of a three-lane map, they're usually rectangular, diamond, or square. Um, they're always going to have three long lanes that flow between the Alpha and Bravo spawns. Those are the long lanes. They always have three. Yep. And then they'll have between one and five cross lanes that go the opposite direction, that go perpendicular to those uh, the majority of the time. And engagements, uh, instead of being defined by quadrants that flow in a circular pattern or flow in and out, they're defined by a front which basically moves back and forth across those cross lanes. Yep, exactly. Exactly right. And uh, one more thing, and Kutch mentioned this earlier, but again, since we're summarizing here, the three lane maps promote long range play a lot more so, at least on the outside, than do the circular maps. For example, Cauldron, even if you are on the outside, because the map is curved, it's very hard to get an extremely long sight line that isn't broken up by something. Whereas Black Shield, if you're on that outside sight line, that long cross lane, or that long, not cross lane, sorry, the long lane from Alpha side to Bravo side, you've got a ton of sight. 
you can look all the way down it and sometimes there's a little bit of cover in between those lanes just to break them up to make them not completely sniper territory but i mean those lanes have some have some distance to them yeah it's something you can think about is uh you know on those circular maps you don't tend to see a lot of camping snipers and if you do those those players tend to get punished for it um whereas on a three lane map there is a place for that kind of play um it's not always, you know, it's not always every lane. Sometimes it's just one lane that really uh, enables that. But but there does tend to be a place where if you want to hard scope a lane, you can. Um, and you're not going to find that very often on a circular map. I mean, Waterfall on Pantheon is like sniper heaven at this point in time. And that's a lane. That's a lane there for snipers. Yep. Um, circular maps, you know, you can't camp and snipe because there's no angle that you can back yourself into. You're not defending a side. People are going to be coming from either side at any given time because, again, it flows around. So you may be sitting in a room on Cauldron, and people could be coming from both sides simultaneously, like to you know to pincer you. And that's not really something that's going to happen on Pantheon. Think about sitting in Waterfall Hallway, and someone appears from behind you and in front of you. Like that, that almost never happens. But on Cauldron, it happens all the time, and that's the difference between a circular map and you know a three-lane map. That's really where it is. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Case case in point right there. And there are, you know, those aren't the only two types of maps that already exist. I can already hear people, you know, saying, oh, there are different maps. This map is this shape. This map is this shape. Yeah, but those are the two main maps that you're going to see. Yep. Not just in Destiny, but also in, you know, first-person shooters in general. Those are the main maps you're going to see. Those are tenants of map design that they build off of. Um, there are a couple of other maps. For example, there's what's called a figure eight map, which uh, I guess an example of that would be Widow's Court. It's where there's, you know, the outside lanes function similarly to the way a three lane map does, meaning there's long sight lines on the outside. Um, but the inside is basically two circular lanes that connect like a figure eight. Yep. So if you're looking at the overhead map of Widow's Court, um, you don't have a lane going straight down from Bravo spawn to Alpha spawn. There's a giant building in the way. It blocks it off. Instead, you've got a circular lane that wraps around that building. It basically goes down the street that's close to B, and it goes down the ramp that's close to A, and it goes into that courtyard. Uh, simultaneously, you have people coming out of the castle and onto perch into that same bottom area, that little depression, and then you have people coming out of the church into that little bottom area in the depression, and you have people coming up from Alpha. So it's more chaotic than a normal three-lane map because it's not just two intersecting lanes. You've got a bunch of lanes all coming into one place, so the, the center is quite chaotic, but because the center is not you know, a capture point, Bottom Street, that little depression in uh, Widow's Court is not useful space. You don't need to be down there. But what it is is people are fighting across that space, if that makes sense. So instead of just having two lanes intersect, in this case we've got what basically equates to three full lanes intersecting, but at the same time, there's no actual reason to go in there and fight it out close range. It's just a bunch of lanes coming together, but no reason to run into the center of them and, you know, cause chaos like you would for B flag on uh, on Cauldron. Yes, yeah, so you'll you'll have a lot of, I think, on a, on a figure eight map on, on Widow's Court, for example, you're, you're going to have um, kind of a very different a very different motion and some very different paths than you might see on a three lane map. Um, you're going to be moving at a lot more angles, but it's not it's not a circular map either because you're not necessarily fighting in quadrants in the same way that you do on a circular map. It's it's a much it's it's, it's a different sensibility. The the whole point of difference from a circular map and a figure eight map is a circular map you're fighting inside the circles, just like you said inside the quadrants. Yep. On a figure eight map, you're following those lanes. They are defined lanes. They're just lanes that are not straight like they would be on a three lane map you know the outside movement is very similar and the inside movement is kind of similar it's just more chaotic it's like a it's like a mix in between a circular map and a three lane map but it in my opinion it airs more towards a three lane map than it does a circular one yeah i i think that's i think that's fair to say um when I initially started thinking about this, I, I first thought that Widow's Core was a three-lane map, and then I kind of looked at it, and I realized, yeah, it, does, it doesn't really fit that definition. It doesn't, it doesn't actually make sense as a three-lane map, but it's, it's close. It has, it has some, some similar concepts in terms of combat. And then there's another couple of, there's another couple of designs that are kind of one-offs. Like Exodus Blue is actually a four-lane map. 
It has four lanes going from alpha side to bravo side, and then it doesn't have any center intersecting cross lanes. So the only cross lanes are on alpha side and on bravo side. There's not a cross lane in the center, which is pretty interesting. So it's got four lanes flowing across, four long lanes, and then the only two cross lanes are at either end, which is pretty interesting. And it kind of works on Exodus Blue. You know, it's interesting. I wouldn't design all maps like that. I think it'd get very boring. And then another one, Vertigo is an interesting map. It's a diamond. It's a normal diamond three lane, but the cross lane that goes from B to what would normally stretch all the way out to island doesn't. It stops because that island is floating off there in the distance. The only way you can get to it is by jumping or a portal. So that cross lane actually splits in two. And when it splits in two, it provides another lane that goes from alpha to C on vertigo. So from the alpha capture point to the C capture point or from alpha team's rift to bravo team's rift uh, through that little hallway that takes you up to the low special ammo. So that's actually, it's almost, almost a four lane map. And the reason why it kind of isn't really is because that island over there, which would normally be the point of that outside lane, is not used as much for that as it could be because it's so far out there and because it doesn't have that much cover. So the area between A and C, that little special ammo thing, functions as like its own tiny little lane. So it's, you know, it's still a three lane map as far as it goes in terms of basic overall structure. It's still very much a diamond three lane. You know, you've got that center, center, uh, path that goes directly from alpha spawn to bravo spawn um down through bottom mid and then you've got the one that goes up to b up to portal basically and then down and that part is 100 percent normal for a three lance the other side where the designers tried to throw a little a little funny junk at us basically yeah it, looking at it it's uh it, it's a little weird it almost looks like a sideways kind of double diamond it, it really throws you off but then if you think about it yeah you're not you're not really using that island as the outside of the three lane. You're you're kind of, it's an odd little, <laughs> it's an odd little bit of architecture. It kind of throws things off a little bit, but uh, um, but yeah, it, it really plays much more like a standard diamond three lane would. Then you'd think it would. Looking at it from the sky, it looks weirder than it does in actual gameplay. Um, and so those are those are just some of the one offs. And there's obviously more that could be talked about, but we don't have time to talk about every single map in the game. We just want to give you examples so you could look at it on your own. Um, and, you know, now, so knowing the layout of a map is the first step in the battle, and it is probably the most important thing, but there's a lot more to map knowledge than just layouts. In fact, there's a ton of stuff besides the layouts. You know, knowing the layout gives you the characteristics. You know what battle types there are going to be. Uh, you know whether it's going to be rotating or whether it's going to be frontal. You know what weapons you can bring into what areas. But that's only, like I said, that's only the first part. The next things you need to start looking at are, is the map symmetrical or not? This is huge, huge, huge. Pantheon is symmetrical. It doesn't matter if you get Alpha or Bravo spawn. It really makes no difference at all. Bannerfall is symmetrical. It doesn't matter which side you get. Now, are there small little differences? Of course there are, but it, they don't really matter. All right, those are symmetrical maps. Shores of Time, asymmetrical. Firebase Delphi, asymmetrical. Blind Watch, asymmetrical. And you know just as well as I do that on every single one of those maps, there's an area that is better to be on that side. For Shores of Time, you better damn well be holding C because it is so much easier to hold C than it is to attack C. On Firebase Delphi, you better be holding A because it is easier to hold A than it is to attack it. And on Blind Watch, you better hold C because it is easier to hold C than it is to attack it. Those are asymmetrical maps. And you need to know, as soon as you figure out the layout of a map, you need to think, is this map symmetrical or is this map asymmetrical? If it's symmetrical, doesn't matter what side I start on. If it's asymmetrical, I need to get to the side with the advantage right now. All right, so symmetry is a huge, huge thing once you figure out what type of map it is. The other thing that you can really take away from symmetry is that it's a great way to learn symmetrical maps much faster because you don't have to spend as much time exploring both sides. You can really just spend a lot of time on whatever side you happen to be on, and you're going to have a really good sense for how the other side works at the same time. And speaking of learning the maps, that, that brings us to our next point. You need to learn the areas. You need to learn the focal points of the map. And the reason why is because that's what gives you situational awareness. The sooner you know the areas of the map, and you do that by looking at focal points, uh, you find something that stands out, and there's something that stands out in every individual section of a map. They're put there on purpose by map designers so that players can learn where they are and so they can orient themselves much quicker. If you make a conscious effort to notice these things, 
you call attention to them, your situational awareness will skyrocket. You'll spawn, and instead of wondering, shit, where am I right now? You'll see, oh, there's a water tower. I'm by this part of the map because I know where water tower is. And not only that, but when you're playing with teammates, uh, call outs don't do anything if you say, oh, over here, over here. No, you don't say over here. You say on C, on B, on low heavy, on water tower. You know, something like that on outside heavy you say that stuff and your teammate immediately now has increased situational awareness as long as he or she also knows where that focal point is or where that area is the second you learn the areas call outs mean more to you they mean more to your teammates your situational awareness just gets you know exponentially bigger when you learn the areas of the map and you do that by looking for focal points Something I want to draw, I think, everyone's attention to on, especially on three-lane maps. Circular maps, I think, are a little bit different, but have some of the same concepts. Um, but these focal points tend to be at uh, crossroads. They tend to be um, uh, along, you know, one of your one of your main lanes and then one of the cross lanes meeting, and you tend to have a, a very clear visual focal point. Now, there are going to be other call-outs that you're going to want to learn as well, but just take a take burning shrine as a great example of this you know so you've got um, your first cross lane uh, if you're coming from alpha you're gonna have that outside platform outside heavy is gonna be meeting right at that first crossroads um, moving in then you've got pillar room right on B so you can call it B you can call it pillar um, but there's a very clear visual focal point even for somebody who's only been on that map that map once if you say pillar they're gonna know where you are and moving past that, you've got bridges, another very clear, easily differentiated focal point. It's a very easy thing to figure out, okay, if I say bridges, even somebody, like I said, who's only been on the map once is going to know where those bridges are. It's going to be very easy for them to, to understand and to gain awareness from that call out. Um, and then inside platform or inside heavy, another obvious call out, another cross lane right there. And then, of course, I, I guess I skipped outside heavy um, or, or maybe just outside um, that that back um, alpha cross lane that that maybe doesn't see as much play unless you're trying to snipe uh, in the sun. So um, just to, just as a great example of how you can take one map, break it down, and figure out what are the easy visual focal points I can use for callouts. And once you start learning areas, you're also going to start learning which areas are better for you to attack, which areas are better for you to defend. A very easy way to know which areas are good for defense, which areas are good for offense, besides the signals the map makers put you. You know, if they put B somewhere, B is not easy to defend. If B were easy to defend, whoever got it first would win every time. So you know damn well that B is going to be, you know, a hard place to defend. And likewise, you know, A and C are going to be much easier to defend because they want you to be able to hold those. Um, but besides that, you got to start looking for entrances. So the best example that I can come up with right off the top of my head is Cauldron. Cauldron's B room, that room has five entrances into it, all right? It is not easy to defend. If you go into B room on Cauldron, you are going to have to cover five entrances to prevent people from being able to come in at a door that you're not looking in, all right? So you need to think, is it smart to go in and try to defend B with my life, or is that not a good place to go defend? Conversely, on Black Shield, inside only has three entrances it's actually pretty darn easy to defend a black shield from the inside all right and there's only three entrances one team can easily defend all three of those entrances and the reason why is when a player has to run through an entrance like they are forced to do it or they will lose the game that entrance now becomes what we call a choke point so there's a difference between entrances and choke points. They seem kind of like they're the same thing, but they're not. For example, if we're sticking with Black Shield right now, um, over on either side of Black Shield, you've got, uh, I believe they're called Barracks on Bravo side, and you've got maybe, uh, what's the other one, just called Cave or like Elbow? Cave, usually, yeah. Yeah, you've got so you've got Cave on Alpha side, you've got Base, Barracks, whatever it's called on Bravo side, right? Those places are just entrances because the space does not determine who wins or loses the game for the most part. So if you are walking through one of those things, you're walking through an entrance. However, if you are holding inside on Firebase Delphi, A door and C door are now choke points because the other team has to come through there to beat you. 
So that's the difference between a choke point and an entrance. An entrance, you can walk through it. Someone could walk through it. A choke point, they have to walk through it. You have to go out a choke point. And that's why they're called choke points. It funnels players into them. And one person can hold down a choke point versus two or three players who are trying to come through it. The reason being, when someone walks through a choke point, they're predictable. You know where they're going to be. When you're on the other side of a choke point, there's any number of places you're going to be. And there are places you're more likely to be. But the thing is, is people walking through a choke point don't know where you are. You know exactly where people who are coming through a choke point are. Um, you know, there's a ton of examples of that. Frontier. You know, those the center doorways on each one. Those are entrances until you know people have to come through them and then they're choke points. So, for example, if you have a sniper looking at... Um, the center door. They walk one person out that, they get sniped. They know they can't go through it, right? Now they're being forced to funnel through one side or the other. They're being forced. Now they've lost an entrance and they've gained two choke points. If you have nobody covering any of those doors, they've got three entrances. They can just walk around the same way they want. You know, can can you think any other examples of that, Kutch? I'm, I'm trying to come up with as many as I can here to really drive home the point. Well, so one, I, th I think one good example, and I guess take this one or leave it, but if, you play, if you're going back to Frontier and playing Rift on Frontier, Bridge is just a devastating choke point. Um, if you've got a team that is trying to push for that spark, you know exactly where they're going to be. You've got multiple angles that you can shoot them from. And they have to walk out into that fire in order to get that spark. They have to either do that or find another way around. You know, it's easiest when there are entrances into B to think about that. Like there are rooms that have, or there are, you know, maps that have B sealed off in its own room. So I guess we can talk about Cauldron again for a hot second. Sure, and that's a good one. if nobody has B, then those doors are entrances. If somebody has B those doors are now choke points because the other team has to come through those doors to get B or they're probably going to lose. So they, it's no longer voluntary anymore. It's mandatory. And, you know, that works on basically every map that has entrances that can funnel like that. Your example for Rift and Bridge on Frontier was excellent. Exodus Blue, I think B is another fantastic one. Yes, exactly. Because it's sealed off in that room. So if you're, if, you know, if you're holding A and you take B... I mean, you're going to do exactly what literally everybody does, right? You're going to you're going to force the other team to come into that room. They're going to have to sit out there on crates and try to uh, try to force their way through with bodies, or they're going to have to try to find their way around. They will not be able to attack you directly because you've got a choke point. Yep. They're going to come in through crates and they're going to die repeatedly trying to grenade you out of B, and you've got a ton of cover and two great angles to shoot out of. Um, or they're going to have to try to force their way around to A through one side or the other, which is going to be uh, tough for them as well because you're you've got center control on that map at that point. So it's that's that's a choke point right there, and that's kind of a different map, but it's it's still a fantastic example of choke yeah. points. All right, and one more example, just because I'm looking at Bannerfall's map from the top down, and it's got some fantastic choke points as well. So at the beginning of the game, all those tunnels, you know, arches, balcony, alley, those are all entrances or exits. As soon as you take that front and you push them back into their spawn, those all become choke points. Because the only way they can win is by going out of those doors and pushing out, and you're looking at those doors knowing full well that they're going to be coming out of them. So they're no longer an entrance now. They are now a choke point. They have to go through them. You know they're going to go through them. right? So that's, that's just another example. So the difference between entrances and choke points, again, to summarize, entrances are voluntary. You can, someone can come through an entrance. A choke point is mandatory. They will come through that entrance. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think that really that really sums it up to its most uh, the, the most core part of that concept. And we talk about predictability and you've got something that is a fantastic fantastic tool that a lot of people probably don't even know is a mechanic in the well, not a, not a game mechanic, but is something that good players use when we talk about predictability, you know, You've got to just nail down to a science. Why don't you talk about framing? Okay, so framing is not just something that you can use as a player. It's actually an element of game design. Uh, so one of my one of, one of my many interests is uh, is reading and and watching and, and just studying 
uh, game design mechanics and, and things that game designers do in order to influence player behavior in the game. And an element of map design that is very common and, and really very important to understand is framing. So the way the way this works, let's, let's think about it first from a game designer's perspective. So when a player is playing a PvP game, um, or, or any game, really, PvE applies as well, um, they have a limited field of vision, right? And in Destiny, I think <laughs> some some maybe PC-centric players would complain about this field of vision, but that's, that's neither here nor there. You, you have a limited amount of uh, area that you can see straight ahead, framed by that rectangle of your screen. And so if, uh, if a map for PvP or an area for PvE E is designed well, that frame is going to contain all of the primary sources of danger and conflict and action that you need to be able to see. So if you, you know, if you're running down a lane on Pantheon, you should be able to see, say if you're going down a waterfall hallway, looking straight ahead, you can see all of the possible areas that an enemy player could come from. Right, and so that's your frame, and then within that frame, you've got different uh, different points that you're going to be checking. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna have a checklist in your brain, whether you know it or not, whether you're doing this consciously or subconsciously. You're going to look first. Uh, maybe first you look straight across. You're checking for a sniper. Then you check waterfall. See, you know, is there anybody up there? Then you look toward the bridge. You know, is there anybody on the bridge? Um, and so that is uh, that is something that is intentionally done by game designers. We hope. Right, we don't want them to <laughs> to not be thinking about that, um, because then you might end up with uh, a frame that maybe doesn't contain all of the places that you need to be checking, and maybe you can get shot from anywhere on the map. Um, this is a complaint that I that I might level against some of the more open circular map designs, is that it can be very difficult to make good decisions about where to check first because the the frame from which you can be shot is larger than your screen, right? So that's uh, that's framing from a game design perspective. It's uh, it's the game designer attempting to give you a a defined area that fits within your field of vision uh, where conflict can happen, and and give you the opportunity to make a decision, uh, either a good one or a bad one, about where to look first for that enemy. Um, and so as a player. If you know about that, you can consciously take advantage of it. Um, if you know that on a given map, you know, you turn down a hallway, you have, say, like, let's use again waterfall hallway because it's a very simple frame to look at. You have, you know, essentially three places that enemies could be. They can be at the other end of the hallway. Uh, they can be up uh, on waterfall or they can be on bridge, right? Um, and so you're going to make that mental checklist. Where is somebody most likely to be? And the first thing you're probably going to do is check for a sniper at the end of the hallway because that's probably what's going to happen in that hallway. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on what the enemies have been doing, maybe they've been pushing up toward top heavy a lot. Maybe it's heavy right now. Um, maybe they've been trying to control cube, in which case you might want to check bridge first. So you're going to have to make those mental decisions. They're not always going to be the same, but you're already doing this. You're already checking for enemy players, whether you know it or not. And so it's a matter of taking that knowledge that the game designer has intentionally given given you three to four places to check and saying, okay, which of these is most likely to have a target? Um, so if you, if you want to think about uh, kind of a picture in your head of how this has happened in the game, how this has maybe been used against you, um, let's say you've been sitting in that waterfall hallway on Pantheon, my favorite example, um, you've been sitting there hard scoping that lane. Somebody comes sliding around the corner and just immediately maps you. That's because they were they were using framing to their advantage and you were not prepared for it. You were maybe sitting at head level and they understood that you were going to do that. They understood he's gonna be, you know, somebody's gonna be sitting down at the other end of the hallway ready to shoot me. So I'm going to be where he does not expect me. And I know where he's going to be, so he's going to get shot in the head. And that can happen around any corner, on any map. Uh, if you understand where enemy players are likely to be, and you come around that corner aiming 
at the first place that somebody is most likely to be and ready to immediately check the second place and the third place. You stand a much better chance of staying alive, of getting a kill, and uh, of winning that game. And conversely, you know, we talked about choke points. Choke points are an excellent example of framing because it, it gives you an even narrower uh, group of areas where an enemy player could be coming from, generally only one. And then it's just figuring out, are they going to be sliding or are they going to be walking around the corner? And that's maybe a judgment call. <laughs> it maybe depends more on the enemy player than, than anything else. But, um, but that's an example of how to use framing to your advantage. It's a huge difference between good players and bad players. A bad player walks around a corner and looks around. A good player walks around a corner and is already looking where he goes. And it becomes a game of, you know, 4D chess. A good player is 10 steps ahead of a bad player, and the bad player doesn't even know what game they're playing, basically. Like, the good player knows from experience and from observing the map where the most logical place is to be. When you're defending, you know, when you are the person who is walking around the corner, you have to know where the person who's looking at the corner is going to be. And vice versa, it's the same thing. If you are defending a corner, you have to know where the most likely spot is for the person to walk around that corner. Bad players don't understand that a lot, and it takes them a long time to pick up the knowledge. Good players grasp it very quickly and immediately know it, and then they can start playing on that. They can say, you know, this player thinks I'm going to come around the corner right here. Because it would make the most sense to do that. I'm going to do something else and catch them off guard. You know, that's why I'm saying it starts to become a mental game at that point in time. Yeah. And good players don't good players don't walk around corners. They slide around corners. Or they jump around corners. Why? Because bad players walk around corners. Yeah. If you uh, if you can put your if you can put your opponent off guard by coming at them from an angle that they don't expect. If you can find an angle in that frame that they don't think you can hit them from then you have the advantage. You have the edge at that point. But you only get that when you understand where their frame of vision is, where it is that they're looking, what they can see, and what angles are most likely to be logical. So you have to have a little empathy for the other player. You have to be able to see the world as they see it. Um, and some of that comes from experience, and some of that you can kind of kickstart by understanding how maps work and how maps are laid out. Because choke points, they're doing the framing for you you know an enemy is going to be coming through this spot. When you're inside on Black Shield, looking at a door, the enemy has framed themselves for you. Yep. There's only one place they can be coming from, and it's that door. Now, whichever side you look at, okay, but neither one of those, they're not far away from the other. You can switch from one to the other very quickly. Whereas when they walk through that door and they're looking for you, are you down low? Are you up high? Are you right in the middle? Are you sitting off to, all the way off to the left where they have to walk all the way in to see you? Where are you? You're not framed for them. They're framed for you. And it makes it very, very easy. That's why choke points are so powerful. And that's why I said it's all about predictability. How predictable is the opposing player? How much can you narrow down the options that you have to go through before you know for a fact what they're doing? Yep. The best players are always thinking about this type of stuff until it becomes second nature. And then once they stop thinking about it, once it stops being conscious, it goes into the realm of unconscious decisions. It pushes towards something we call flow. Flow is something we're going to talk about in a whole different episode. Maybe a couple episodes down the way, we're going to talk about flow because it's it's when you get into like that Zen state in the game, basically, and everything just falls into place for you. And there's still more you'll have to do besides map knowledge. But I mean, realistically, when you look at it, when you look at the things you need to do before the game, we've talked about them. The things you need to do during the game, we've talked about them. The things you shouldn't do during the game, we've talked about them. The weapons you should use, we've talked about. Now we're talking about the map knowledge. You take all these things, you put them all together, and you're almost there once you start actually having it happen. It's, it's, it's exciting for me to talk about all this stuff because you know the fastest way you learn something is by teaching it. And since I've been doing these podcasts, I myself have been thinking, oh crap, I need to do this more. I need to focus more on this. I'm getting better as a player yeah. by doing these podcasts. And I, and I really hope you guys are too because you know, these, are, these are knowledge bombs we're dropping here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really amazing how you can take um, just really kind of digging into and studying some of these topics. And even if you're a casual player, if you're somebody like me who plays maybe uh, five to ten hours a week uh, when things are slow, maybe ten to twenty 
um, you know, when something new drops, uh, you can still keep up with people who are hardcore, who are going 30, 40, 40 hours a week. If you are thinking about these things consciously, um, you can you can really kickstart your own progress and, and push yourself further um, just by being a little bit more thoughtful about it. Um, you know, and, and taking this uh, taking this concept of framing, um, you know, it really ties into everything else. I know, uh, Merck, you've got some other topics that are really, um, I, I think, play into it as well. You already talked about symmetry. Um, symmetry is really is really fantastic. A symmetrical map makes everything easy for you. Once you understand, like I said, half the map, you know how the other half is framed. You know exactly where people are going to come from. All you have to do is figure out your half of the map. Um, and, and so that really just lays it out for you, makes it much easier to, uh, to grasp how things work, where people are going to be, uh, where they're going to be coming from, and where they're going to. You know, we've got, we've got a couple other things we want to talk about in map knowledge. We're not done quite yet. There's some things that aren't quite as important. We went over like the really, really important ones right there, but there's at least three more that we're going to talk about. The first one is pickups. And in Halo, these were incredibly important. In Destiny, a little bit less so. In Destiny 2, they're going to go back to being pretty important. Pickups, special ammo, heavy ammo. That's what it is. At this point in time, special ammo is more important than it used to be, uh, but it's still relatively easy to come by. But you need to be aware of where the special ammo is. If you don't know where it is, it's no fun to be running around out of ammo. Heavy ammo is a little bit different. There are two types of heavy ammo placements. One of them is in an engagement area. Um, think... Ooh, what's a good example of this? Um, Pantheon. Yeah, outside heavy on Pantheon is is a huge. Yeah. outside heavy on Pantheon and waterfall heavy. Those are engagement areas. Yep. It brings both teams together in that area. Then you've got you know floating garden where they have a heavy at each base. Both teams split up to go get those heavies. You need to think about what type of placement is this ammo. Is this ammo somewhere where I'm going to be engaging people, or is it somewhere where I'm going to be relatively safe? Um, in Destiny 2, it's going to be even more important because you're the only one who gets the ammo when you go pick it up. Nobody else gets it. So you can't just be near it, luckily, and then walk over and pick it up. So that's pickups are going to be crazy important at that point in time. Um, the next two things, cover and verticality, they kind of go hand in hand. Cover is, you know, something that breaks up sight lines. How far apart cover is basically determines what type of weapon you can use. If cover's really close together, you can move between covers very quickly. Short range weapons are exceptionally powerful. Um, if cover's really far apart, really spread out, you got a long time in between cover, long range weapons are extremely powerful. And it's similar to verticality. In, in my opinion, the high ground is the best ground, almost always. It is so much easier to engage someone when you have you know, a vertical advantage on them. Think how much easier it is to shoot down onto someone's head than it is to shoot up onto someone's chin, basically. And the way I want you guys to think about this is think about a blinking hunter from year one. They would blink above you and then fall down on you. Yep. Now, obviously it was hard to kill them because they're blinking to begin with. But even if you knew what they were going to do, looking up and killing someone who's falling out of the sky, they're traveling much faster when they're falling than you can travel strafing. They're much harder to hit when they're in the sky, and they're much harder to hit when they're above you in general because you have to shoot up at their head, whereas they're shooting down at that giant bulbous target that is the top of your head. It makes it incredibly easy for them. If you have the ability to, and you have sufficient cover, like obviously top of cube on Pantheon isn't necessarily the best place to take advantage of verticality. You have no cover up there. But you can still get the advantage on people using that vertical you know, space, basically. And there's a ton of vertical space in Destiny. It's not You're not in-air accurate as much in D1. You're going to be more in-air accurate in D2 from the gameplay I've seen and played myself. But you know, anytime you can take advantage of a high playing field, looking down on people, do it. Think of the top, think of top B on floating gardens, looking onto either one of those spawns. It makes it so easy to pick people off up there. And the same can be said for the top of, uh, Bravo on black shield. You hide, you head glitch a little bit behind that, uh, behind that, I guess we'll call it a tunnel. And you look down on people coming out of the other two tunnels. It's wonderful. Always use verticality to your advantage and pay attention to cover because it dictates what weapons you can take into an engagement. You know, another great example, I think, of verticality is Asylum. Um, you don't tend to see a lot of people trying to hold Atrium, right? Now, part of that is that uh, B-Flag is, is, up, is upstairs, right? But, 
even but even in clash even in clash people would rather be upstairs because it gives them an advantage it's better to be able to shoot down into street to shoot down into bravo or to shoot down into alpha it's much easier to hold that area and force people to come up against you they have to jump up which leaves them potentially vulnerable they have to run up through choke points um th- th- that higher ground tends to give you a lot of advantages and what's funny is b on asylum actually has more entrances than atrium does it does atrium would be easier to defend but again it's that vertical advantage people are looking down into atrium it's very easy to pick people off when they're down low like that it is much harder to pick people off when they're up high and there are obviously extenuating circumstances it's not purely based just on the verticality of it but i mean you can go on any number of maps and look around balconies on bannerfall perch or the porches on bannerfall frontier the top of the bridge yep i mean on top of pride rock looking down stuff like that uh rusted lands on top of the water tank on top of the truck you know they're just an infinite number of places on top of pillar and vertigo higher vertical space on on top of b looking down into top mid yeah on vertigo Sorry, I'm sorry. That's what I was talking about. I mean, there are a ton of places, a ton of examples where verticality can save your life being higher than someone else, basically. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And in a lot of cases, um, it's, it's almost like giving yourself a free head glitch, right? You can just crouch up high. Um, all they can see is just the barest part of your face. Even if they're crouching behind cover as well, you still have a better view of their head than they do of yours. So when you're thinking about a map, The first thing you need to think about is the layout. And the layout contains the characteristics of the map, meaning, you know, is it circular? Is it three lane? Is it something else? If it's circular or three lane, uh, you know, if it's circular, where are the spokes? If it's three lane, where are the cross lanes? What are the battle types? Circular is more conducive to short and mid range. And three lane is generally more conducive to a little bit longer in mid range. There are obviously still some short range areas, but think about the gun that you're going to be bringing into the engagement based on the map type. Is it going to be a front or quadrant battles? Are you going to be able to hunker down and defend something? Or are you going to have to be circling the map, running around through those quadrants? Those are the things you need to think about with a map layout. You think about, is it symmetrical? Where are the areas and focal points I can focus on? Where are the entrances? Can those entrances turn into choke points? Where are the pickups? And where's my cover and where's my verticality? Those are the things you need to focus on. If you just take away from the summary, if it was too long, didn't listen, you come straight to the end. (laughs) That's what we talked about. There it is for you. Let me also recommend that you check us out at Destiny MVP. And uh, if you're listening to this uh, during Guardian Con, you might be in time to enter a couple of contests. So make sure you hit us up there. Um, As always, we welcome all feedback through... uh, Uh, iTunes reviews, Twitter, Reddit, uh, wherever you want to look us up. We're all over the place. So come find us, come say hi, and uh, let us know what you thought. 